Dear brothers and sisters, today is the second session of the Ten Commandments. Last week, we looked at the first commandments of not having any other gods before me. The one and only God created humans and all that exists and gives life and blessings to mankind. When people serve meaningless idols, other gods, they suffer by the enemy devil and Satan. Our loving God set forth the first commandment so that we can receive protection and blessings by serving only Him. Today we will look at the second commandment which prohibits idol worshipping. This means we must never make for ourselves an idol nor worship any form of idols. But this, is, but this also doesn't simply mean to not worship idols made by our own hands. May everyone pay heed to this message and take the time to check whether you have spiritually idol worshipped. Even if, even if you believe you have only served God, not any other idols. I pray in the name of the Lord that you are you all remove any idols from your lives and come forth as God's beloved and blessed children. Dear brothers and sisters, an idol is an image or a representation of a God used as an object of worship. It's worshiping something made from wood, stone, metal, gold, or silver. In the image of humans, animals, insects, birds, sea creatures, celestial bodies like the sun and the moon and the stars, or from a figment of imagination. Idolatry is uh, creating such images and worshipping them. People made idols have no life, nor does it have power to grant answers and blessings. How foolish and ridiculous would it be for people made in the image of God the Creator to worship idols formed by human hands and pray, it, pray to it for blessings? Isaiah chapter 4 verses Isaiah chapter 46 verses 6 and 7 tell us those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god they bow down indeed they worship it they lift it upon the shoulder and carry it they set it in its place and it stands there it does not move from its place though one may carry to it 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 cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. You have to know, idol is created by man. And they created it and, and they call it their God. How stupid and foolish that is. Super, superstitious and paranormal acts like carrying talismans or performing sacrifices to the dead are also considered idolatry. There are those who believe talismans ward off disasters and bring forth blessings. In reality, it's the complete opposite. If your spiritual eyes are opened, you would see dirty demons and evil spirits attracted to the talismans and idols. These are what cause disasters and calamities. It's important to remember that none other than God can bring blessings to people. Idols only bring disasters. In the last session, I also told you that worshipping evil spirits, people try to worship evil spirits to drive away their disasters, but actually they temporarily take away the calamities and disasters, and they it looks like they can but they want to be served continually. That's why they ultimately continue to bring them disasters. Of course, they can, they can never bring you blessings. Blessings only come from God. Answers only come from God. They are not from those evil spirits. Even if people serve them, they cannot receive blessings. 
people may say, because I'm in. People may say that their disasters are temporarily gone because they evil spirits. They serve evil spirits, but they have repeatedly have to serve idols. They are continually bring in disasters. Fundamentally, they cannot drive away the disasters. You have to know that, and you have to share the gospel. And those people who worship. Evil spirits. If they are not served, they it feels like they bring you harsher disasters. But in uh, but once you believe in God, if you try to if people try to believe God the right way, God has in incomparably greater power. Even though some no, novice believers, novice believers, they may still be affected by the idols they used to serve. If they completely cut off, they have nothing to do with that. But because they had served idols for long, because their ancestors served idols for long, they are like connected by a spiritual cord. Once they completely cut off that, as they try to live out the light, the, the evil spirits bring them disasters. So they may wonder, because is this because I believe in God? But they have to know that God is the true deity and God is the greatest God. Once they completely come into God, evil spirits cannot even touch them. This gospel clarifies that, so I hope you can make use of that when you share the gospel. Why people desire to make and worship such meaningless idols? They are obviously created by man, by God's, by man's hand. People have an, people have an innate need to see with their own eyes and touch with their own hands for complete satisfaction. In Exodus chapter 32, the Israelites who left Egypt had experienced God's power so many times, but still, they made and worshipped idols, incurring God's wrath. The Israelites served Moses, whom God was with, as if he were God. When Moses left them to receive the commandments from God, the Israelites could not endure his absence and created and worshipped idols. They made a golden calf calling it the God who had led them. Through this, the Israelites received God's great wrath. Brothers and sisters, we cannot physically see nor make a physical image of God who is spirit. So it's important to never make an idol and worship, worship it as God. God tells us not to do that. But people have a nature to see with their hands, uh, with their eyes, and touch with their hands. But this shouldn't just be applied to physical idols. We can also apply this to our Christian faith. We, we let's say you experience great works of the Holy Spirit. This is our, this is what happens in our heart, inspiration from our heart. But how does that last? Some people have. experience uh, like they have physical experience like they are healed of a disease It, they directly met God that way this is the evidence of the living God even though they experience that they still haven't seen God with their own eyes that's why as time passes they forget about that that's why they seek what they see with their eyes touch with their hand It's been a month since we finished the summer retreat. You were filled with the God's grace. And how did that grace last? How, do you, how much of the grace you remember? How much of them you keep it in your heart? You have to keep it last long. Some people, you have to keep going for a year. And, and then next year, you will have more fullness of the Spirit. You have to pile them up. without forgetting them, without losing them. 
But some people, after they attend, uh, they shed all the tears and you see God's grace. But after a while, they have a change of heart. People have a nature to wanting to see with their own eyes and touch with their hands. But faith is to believe what is not visible. Father God calls it faith. When you, but some people, when they feel something, they're joyful. But what they have to do is to maintain it and repay the grace. That's how you make your faith growth. You have to. You have to maintain it. That's why you have to stay awake in prayer. Then the Holy Spirit will help you. People wanted the Israelites wanted to make and serve idols. How foolish they were! They made a golden calf themselves, and then they call those they call that golden calf as a god who led them out of Egypt. How foolish that is! But we are the same. We receive the grace. We we receive God's grace through the praise and sermons. And the Holy Spirit gave you the inspiration, and we clearly, explicitly experience them. But once we go go out into the world, we tend to forget the grace. That's why we are. become like people who served idols again. We shouldn't become foolish ones. We have to check whether we also become foolish like that. Some people who say that they believe in God, serve and worship idols that aren't physical idols. For example, they worship or pray before a picture of Jesus. They make an image of the Virgin Mary or one of the pioneers of faith and worship before it. They make a huge statue or huge, they uh, touch their feet or kiss on them or pray before them. They, we see those scenes. There are also forms of idolatry that God despises. The Virgin Mary and the pioneers of faith, the pioneers of faith are God's creatures and are not to be worshipped. Only God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit should be an object of our worship and prayer. Even if you make an image of God the Son, it is not the real image of Jesus. It is simply from an artist's or sculptor's imagination, and the description varies from person to person. Worshipping and praying in front of these items end up being forms of idol worshipping. However, some people reject the idea of idolatry so much that they even consider the cross in the church to be an idol. The cross is not an idol, but a symbol of gospel which we believe in. Jesus carried the wooden cross and shed His precious blood. The reason that we look upon the cross is to remind ourselves of His precious blood and the grace of redemption. The cross is not an object of worship, nor an idol. The images of Jesus holding a lamb or of the Last Supper are not forms of idols on their own. They only represent the fact that Jesus is the Good Shepherd or depict Jesus' ministry. It's not that we worship or pray to these images, but any act of worship or prayer before a sculpture or image of Jesus means idolatry. When some people hear about the commandment of not worshiping any idols, they claim that even Moses made an idol before a picture. When people uh, serve idols, they make uh, some sculpture, they make a They, some people serve their ancestors and they make something and they bow before them and they burn incense. This is the act of worshiping and serving their idols. This is called idol worshiping. There are also but the pictures of Jesus, pictures of the we just think about the meaning we don't bow or worship before them we don't our 
the object of our prayer, we, we pray in spirit. We offer it to the Father. One thing, sometimes our, uh, our shepherd, our pastor, people hang the pictures of our shepherd used to and we don't say I mean we don't worship the picture or we you just like you have your pictures of the loved ones and reminder of the the things we we have the same heart we don't also we have we pray in the name of Jesus Christ and only then we will receive answers the Bible says and the answer from comes from God we have to pray in the name of the Lord and we receive answers from God when you pray you pray before God you before you pray in the name of Jesus but we were misunderstood we It's not that we pray to the shepherd. We, we, didn't, we don't pray be, because we thought that the shepherd gives us answers. And we, saw, and we also played uh, the shepherd's uh, crusade on the screen because it is the history of my men. It's, it shows the 40-year history of my men. m a m i n s history and we reminisce over the history of m a m i n and we are there are many things we are proud of and we remember those times for example during the foundation service season we, we talk about how m a m i n church we cannot so the shepherd's ministry is a m a m i s ministry and uh, when we gave glory to God it, this is what we're proud of that's why we show the scenes of the, the, the shepherd's crusade on the screen during the Daniel prayer meeting and when you when you picture what did the shepherd say he told us to cast off sins and not to love the world and enter New Jerusalem we are reminded of his words and it's not that we ask for blessings or pray, pray before that uh, before the pictures but, but and we We, we, we were misunderstood by that. I hope that you when some people hear about the commandment of not worshipping any idols, they claim that even Moses made an idol. They refer to the incident They refer to the incident featured in Numbers chapter 21 where the Israelites complained about God and were beaten by fiery serpents. When many Israelites were dying from the bite, Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. Anyone who was beaten survived. Anyone who was beaten survived if only they obeyed God's word and looked at it. God commanded Moses to make a bronze serpent, but it was never to make people worship the image. God allowed it to foreshadow Jesus Christ coming to save man from the curse of the law. Just as the people people were saved from death by looking at the bronze serpent, those who are on the way of death due to sins can receive salvation and life when they believe and accept Jesus who hung on the cross as the Lord. Those who mis- those who misconceive that Moses made an idol do not comprehend such spiritual meaning at all. Second Kings chapter 18 verse 4 tells of tells of the future days when King Hezekiah removed all of Israel's idols. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days, 
the sons of Israel burned the incense to it, and it was called the bush stand. Though the bronze serpent was made in God's will, though the bronze serpent was made in God's will, it tells us that under no circumstance should it become an idol or an object of worship. Dear brothers and sisters, until now, we've looked at the fleshly meaning of idolatry. The more important thing is the spiritual meaning embedded in idolatry. The spiritual meaning of an idol refers to anything more loved than God. You don't commit idolatry just by bowing before a statue of Buddha or a sacrificial table. If you follow your fleshy desire and love your parents, spouse, or children more than God, this is also idol-worshipping spiritually. Those who consider themselves the first and foremost and love themselves the most make themselves an idol. This does not mean that we should not love others, but only God. For example, It is very natural for God's children to love their parents in the truth. God also said, Honor your parents. But if you deviate from the truth out of love for your parents, it turns into serving idols as you love your parents more than God. If your, if your unbelieving parents who don't like you, if your unbelieving parents who don't like you going to church on Sunday and you violate the service to please them, this is loving your parents more than God. This not only displeases God, but shows that you do not truly love your parents. If you truly love someone, you would lead them to salvation and to eternal life. This is true love. It's important, not, it's important not only to keep the Sabbath, but to evangelize and pray for your parents to quickly receive salvation. This is how you can truly honor and love your parents. The same goes for parents. If you truly love your children, you must love God first and love your children and God. No matter how much you cherish them, you cannot protect them from the enemy devil by man's power. You cannot cure their incurable, you cannot cure their incurable diseases, nor make them taller. You, don't, you also cannot protect them from accidents. But God can protect them when you fear God, entrust your children to God, and love them in the Lord. God God gives us strength in spirit and in the flesh and blesses us with success in everything. To make this happen, parents should live in the light first and in the truth. Even though their children are still in the darkness or still befriending the world, if the parents also do the same, it's not loving their children. They are together going into hell. Even though your unbelieving family members are resentful, even though you may be misunderstood sometimes, you should not give in to the... I mean, as long as something is not sin, you can uh, grant their request. But if their request goes out of the God's word, you have to cut it off. You have to reject them. Then you can receive God's blessing. Then, ultimately, even your family members will ultimately come and be led on to the light and the truth. But if you surrender, then you will also fall into the darkness. That's why the Bible tells us to cut off the fleshly affection. The same goes for uh, the same for love between a husband and a wife. Those who do not know the true love of God share fleshly love. They quarrel despite saying they are in love. Eventually, they become no better than strangers. But when we love in, but when we love in God, we can share true spiritual love. We can have true and beautiful love that is not provoked, does not act unbecomingly, and doesn't seek its own or change. When we share true love only when we love God the Father first, 
prayer to loving others. We can share to love only when we love God the Father first prior to loving others. That's why God tells us to love Him the most and to not serve idols. God tells us to love Him first, but that doesn't mean we should not love others. It is to love Him first and foremost. We have to prioritize Him, and then we, in the Word of God and in the truth, we have to do our best to love others. As we love our family members like that, we can sacrifice ourselves. So, we can have stronger love than fleshly love. With fleshly love, when some things are not to their liking, people have a change of heart. But spiritual love, even though you suffer a loss, you try to adjust yourself to them, and you have no quarrels, and you seek others' benefits, and you seek comfort of others more. This is true love, and this is true joy. Without understanding such a spiritual meaning, one shouldn't say, the church tells us to only love God. My wife took me to church, and I listened to the sermon, and the pastor said that I should only love God and the family members. There should be no such misunderstanding. If you break God's commandment out of love for money, fame, or knowledge, it also turns into a spiritual idol. These days, many people say they believe in God but love material things more, and they don't even keep the Sabbath. There are also those who break God's commandments to maintain their fame and power in the world. If you break the Sabbath or compromise with the world and fail to live in the truth for the sake of maintaining your wealth, power, and fame, this is also spiritual idolatry. Some people love celebrities and other public figures more than God, making idols of them. It's, it's okay to like it's okay to like people who excel in acting or sports and admire their talents but it's imp- but it's important to not make them idols that come before God for example some of our church members are greatly admired for their excellent talents in singing dancing or musical abilities but this should not mean that they become your idols you have to think about this well in the church for example you you say that you love me and you pursue me and you say that you love me and follow me this should never be of course you you should but that shouldn't change into fleshly love in if you I, I explained that if you love something more than God it is an idol but if you as you love God as you follow me but it shouldn't be a fleshly love I told you several times you have to have strong relationship with God and I have a role to make you I am uh, in a position of a guide. I cannot... And I can help you to connect you uh, to receive answers. I can intercede for you. But you, while you don't do anything, if you just rely on me entirely, you, that, doesn't, that is not, it, it, it is not right according to the law of the spiritual realm. We can benefit a lot from the pastor if your pastor prays for you and pastor prays for you and you can quickly receive an answer. Of course, you also have to satisfy your ju- measure of your justice and then if you rely on your pastor, you can... But if you entirely rely on your pastor, it is not right. It is not... You are not in a right relationship with God. Also, fleshly affection is not good. Fleshly affection is not in your relationship. Uh, let's say, let's say, we, 
If I call the word of God, I mean, you have to discern well and give you an example. Let's say I'm in a private meeting with someone and I talk with someone and, and I said someone gossiped about me and And if you in your relationship with your pastors and also relationship with others, when you love someone, you pay attention to him. And when you pay attention to him, you have to discern. You have to discern whether something is truth or not. You you treat them oh, well, but you treat others not in a good way. And you have to discern things well. When, you, when I say something, and like in a private gathering, if, if I gossip about someone, then I am, that means I have a jealousy and envy. You have to feel that. You have to discern that. Then you have to think, I respected her. I thought that I could learn from her, but she's not doing that. You can discern that way. You should not be carried away by your fleshly love. In relationship with others, in relationship with the pastor, in the church, you have to discern things well. That means, that doesn't mean you have to hate or uh, keep a distance from, you have to know how to discern things. If you cannot discern, you can, if your pastor does something untruthful, you follow him. You have to check yourself well in this regard. In the, in the Performing Arts Committee and in the pastors, Of course, it's, it's good to, I mean, similarly, you may respect and admire the talents of worldly cele celebrities, but if you long for worldly things, always keep them in your heart and love them more than God, you will gradually become estranged from God. And, for example, secular songs and pop songs, they sing about the love and the pain. They always sing about them. Sometimes you really like that song, and the lyrics feel like they represent your heart, and so you like that singer, you like that music artist, and you like their appearance. This is a fleshly affection, and this is you physically... When you follow them, what were you going to do? You, you are interested in that artist's information and you, have, you lose your interest in the Word of God and in the truth. And And you may also, when you hear the praises in the church, you may compare it to the worldly songs, and you have to cut yourself off, off of such worldly things. This is the shortcut to becoming a man of spirit. You have to discern things well. And God is... The same goes for anyone with toys or prized objects. If they have their heart completely taken away by them, they can turn into idols. In the world, there are also movies that show that dolls, uh, demons go into uh, some dolls and harass the children. It could be an imagination, but such, I mean, little kids may have their hearts taken away by the dolls even when their parents tell them to do something they get annoyed and irritated because their hearts are taken away by the dolls you have to discern everything in the truth and what we have to remember is that 
if you have something that you love more than God, it becomes your idol. Even though it is not an idol, you, in your relationship with others, and in your pursuing whatever, you also need a, also need a wisdom to brothers and sisters, the latter half of Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 and verse 6 tell us of a blessing for those who obey the commandments of now worshiping idols and a warning for those who disobey. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. When God says He is jealous, it differs in meaning from normal human jealousy. Human jealousy comes from fleshly desires. It is ugly, dirty, and harmful to others. For example, if love cools between a married couple and the husband finds another significant other, the wife may become jealous and try to harm him. Fighting in anger and hatred, she would disgrace him by notifying others of his wrongdoing. Some people even sue. This kind of jealousy, envy, and revenge relates to jealousy of hate, never jealousy of love. Loving your partner in spirit means you would first look back on yourself and ponder over your faults instead of hovering fleshly jealousy. You would question whether your actions were right before God, whether you loved and served your partner. And instead of telling others your partner's mistakes, you would seek wisdom from God to change his or her mind. A typical example is Esther. He He, she, in order to save her people, she presented herself before God. Actually, the king's love for her had cooled down. And, but before he, she went before God, she moved God. So, the king's heart changed and he began to see her so lovely. You have to check whether you have a right life before God. You have to you have to check whether you spoke harshly to your spouse, whether you didn't serve your spouse well. While you give an excuse out of God's work, you didn't you neglected your duties to your spouse. You have our shepherd also told us to examine our physical duties. For example, wives they are housewives. They have to, if they are, if they don't, uh, if they don't take care, tied up themselves. Uh, when they are in love, she tried to be look beautiful, but as after they get married, because they are busy with the housework, they don't. She doesn't make herself try to make herself beautiful, so the husband may become discouraged, and their their love changes like that. They have to check their love each other, as you have to look back on yourself and and then. Physical jealousy gives a uh, hurt others' feelings. And they, brothers and sisters, then what kind of jealousy of love does God have? His jealousy is beneficial, beneficial to us. If believers worship idols, God looks away from them, so the enemy devil and Satan take over. It's not because God gives them disasters, but God has no choice but to hand over the sinned believers to Satan in line with the law of justice. 
People realize their mistakes, repent, and return to God after facing various trials and tribulations and becoming poor in heart. This is the result of God's jealousy. God's jealousy helps His children go the path of eternal life instead of walking the path of destruction due to sins. It's an expression of His true love. What would happen if God did not get jealous and turned a blind eye to the sinful believers, forgiving unconditionally and letting nothing happen despite their committing sins? People wouldn't be able to repent, so they would repeatedly commit sins and end up on the path of eternal death. Dear brothers and sisters, God is the Father and the Creator who God is the Father God and the Creator who sacrificed even His one and only Son to open the way of salvation for all mankind. He controls all and grants blessings to those who fear Him. Nevertheless, when people love and worship idols rather than God, whom they must serve and honor, it is the same as hating God and committing treason before Him. Those who hate God suffer the consequences. The sin is passed down to the third or fourth generation. As the word says, families that severely worship idols and commit evil continuously suffer with worries and troubles. Financial issues and various tribulations keep coming, and they have people with incurable diseases, disabilities, mental disorders, and demon possession, and suicider. If these tribulations persist over four generations, the family line would crumble and reach a point of no return. Why did God not in why did God not conclude with the fourth generation, but say the third or fourth generation, leaving room for movement? This is a sign of God's mercy. In other words, even if ancestors worship the idols and oppose God, a family member down the line can receive God's mercy and end the disasters if if he repents and seeks God's if he repents and seeks God before the family disintegrates. However, it is not easy for the descendants to believe in God if they have ancestors who opposed God, severely worshipped idols, and piled up in evil. Even if they accept the Lord, it's difficult to live a life of faith as they are spiritually tied to their ancestors. Why? As they worshipped idols, the, the, their ancestors worshipped idols, and it's like as they also worship, uh, serve their ancestors, they brought in demons, and and the family has been harassed by the uh, evil spirits. Even though they accept their offspring, accept the Lord, before they completely live in the light, they are continually affected by the evil spirits, whom their ancestors and they ser and they served. They are harassed. The the enemy devil and Satan continuously bring accusation and hinder them from having faith to lead them back to death anyhow. Even in such cases, if we keep on repeating, uh, if we keep on repenting on behalf of our ancestors with a humble heart, get rid of our own evil, and seek God's mercy, we can surely receive protection through God's grace. Those who love God and keep His commandments will enjoy God's grace for a thousand generations, namely forever. Once again, we can feel God's love through His Word, saying that disasters would last to the third or fourth generation, but blessings for a thousand generations. Let me conclude the message, dear brothers and sisters. If you fear God and don't worship idols, you, along with your descendants, will be blessed. However, just because the ancestors served God well does not mean that the descendants will receive unconditional blessings. For example, Abraham, the father, forefather of faith, was greatly loved by God. God promised, God promised to bless Abraham's descendants for generations to come. However, those who didn't fear God among his descendants 
were not blessed. David also loved God and was promised blessings for his descendants, but those of David's descendants who left God had nothing to do with the promise of blessings. Only as they loved God, lived in the truth, and didn't defile themselves with idols could they receive and enjoy all the blessings accumulated even from above. That means God, even though God promised the blessings for a thousand generations, if you are if you leave God, you you are you cannot be blessed. But if you serve God well, you can. If you serve God, fear God, the blessings will go on, and you can share the blessings of your ancestors. This is the God's promise of blessing. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, I hope that you will not make nor serve any idols for yourselves. I pray in the name of the Lord that you will all abundantly receive and enjoy the blessings God promised to you, your children, and your families for generations to come. Let's reflect on today's message in our prayer. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me pray for the sick. Lay your hands on your sick part. If you're not sick, lay your hands on your chest and receive the prayer. Father God of goodness, let us have life uh, through the message. If you have any idols, please cut it off completely. Even though we have, do not have idols, if we have anything that hinders us from living the truth and living the light, please let us discover them and cut ourselves completely off of them. Please help us. Please lay your hands on all the people who are receiving this prayer. Please make all the diseases in healed. Uh, I command in the name of Jesus Christ, all the enemy, the and Satan, be driven away. All diseases and germs and viruses be scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit and be perfectly healed. Please from head to toe, please lay your hands on from head to toe and make them perfectly healed, perfectly normal, and perfectly healthy. Especially the coronavirus is uh, rampant again. Please protect our members from coronavirus and whatever, whatever it is, the cold, a flu, or if they are suffering with any of them, please make them be scorched by the Father of the Holy Spirit. I command in the name of the Holy Spirit, all the diseases and germs and viruses be scorched and be, be gone. Please protect our members from any of these epidemics and coronavirus. Please protect our students f for the week. Please let them study well and do their duties well. And please protect all our mommy members and Brinji churches. Protect them in your love. Please protect them from any accidents or disasters or any troubles. Please protect their homes and businesses and workplaces. Thank you. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.